currently the Hague and Isabel Berberian and Dow Chair in Armenian Studies at Cal State Fresno. And if you don't know what an, Ad an endowed chair is, it means someone's willing to pay really big bucks because you're really good to pay your salary to have your expertise at the university. And uh, CSU Fresno has an Armenian Studies, quite remarkable Armenian Studies uh, department. Uh, lots of scholarships and awards, and it belongs to what we call learning societies. That's where people who are learned get together and show each other how learned they are. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that has always struck me about Sergio is he's not going to have any problem communicating with you because he speaks classical Armenian, modern Armenian, Latin, Greek, Syriac, <laughs> <laughs> Middle Persian, French, Italian, German, and Hebrew. But the most wonderful thing is he speaks wonderful English. <laughs> the English part. I'm from New York, so if you do have problems understanding me, that's, some of my students sometimes complain that they can't hear. Can you guys hear me all? Is that okay? Turn it, turn it up. Pretty much people, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Is this all right? Okay, all right. I'm from New York, I can talk loud. <laughs> um, my name is Sergio Laporta. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Myrna Goodman and uh, Sonoma State University for inviting me and also the Alliance for the Study of the uh, Holocaust and the Genocide uh, for having invited me year after year to um, lecture uh, on this topic. Um, as you could probably guess from my name, I am not of Armenian descent. My, neither one of my parents of Armenian descent. My father is Sicilian, my mother was English and Dutch. And actually my own uh, field of expertise, of study, uh, of interest, is in Armenian cultural and intellectual life uh, between the 12th and 14th centuries. However, over uh, my uh, uh, career uh, as an Armenologist, as we say, in Armenian studies, obviously I've, had, I've come into numerous uh, contacts with people you know, who were either survivors of the genocide or descendants of survivors of the genocide. And so this as an auxiliary topic to my own personal research has become quite important to me. Um, I also, uh, growing up in New York, had uh, several Jewish friends and the experience of the Holocaust uh, uh, for, the, uh, for their um, grandparents uh, and, uh, was also quite an influential uh, aspect of my own life. And before I was at Fresno State, uh, I taught for eight years at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem where I was able to sort of partake in both communities, the, obviously the Jewish-Israeli community as well as the Armenian community in the Old City. Um, and we there too held genocide commemoration events with scholars of Holocaust studies as well as members of the Armenian community. So um, this has been something that I've been doing uh, for quite a while um, and it's because I, I do believe it's so important. And if your education was anything like mine, I'm betting that most of you here have had 
little or no exposure to either Armenian or the Armenian genocide prior uh, to this course. Unless you're of Armenian descent yourself, this is not something that I would presume most of you have had in high school. Did anybody actually remember studying this topic in high school around World War I? No, they probably glanced right over it. They may have mentioned some sort of happenings, um, uh, tragic events surrounding the war in which 1.5 million Armenians were killed, uh, but they don't go into it into any detail at all. It's not part of our popular consciousness um, um, at any level, really. And um, I'm hoping that through these lectures, and, and this course in particular, that we'll be able to change that uh, perception. Uh, and slowly it has become the change, so I, I, am, I am happy about that. But I also presume that most people here, other than their own, if you had Armenian friends um, or you had some exposure uh, to Armenians, may know something about it. But I, I always start off, um, let's see if I can get this thing working, yes, um, uh, this presentation um, with a little bit of geography. Just so people know where Armenia is today, there is a country, the Republic of Armenia. It's a former Soviet uh, Republic. So I, I want to get you familiar with where it is today, as well as where, um, where Armenians used to live uh, prior to the genocide. And I'd also like to give a quick introduction to historical Armenia. Um, and there, I will talk about this, there's several reasons for this. Um, because Armenian's history Right? It's very important to them to this day. And I also want to emphasize right, that the genocide is not what defines Armenians. We'll see this um, in a little bit. It is one historical experience, but the Armenians have had a historical and cultural um, existence for over 3,000 years. So this is one episode in a very long and dynamic cultural history. And so I do like to give some sort of historical depth um, uh, to the topic. Uh, so that people can appreciate right, not just what happened to the Armenians, but also what Armenians have done um, throughout the millennia. Um, I will then turn to a historical context of the genocide. When did it happen? What were the circumstances surrounding it? Right, and its perpetration, or as I call it, uh, the paradigm of genocide. Uh, how, um, how what happened to the Armenians actually does reflect a genocidal pattern. And then finally, I, I will draw upon what lessons we can learn from the Ar Armenian Genocide. Particularly, we'll look at legacies of the Armenian Genocide. First, immediate ones, things that happened immediately after the genocide, but continue to affect us to this day, uh, as well as some longer term effects uh, uh, of the genocide. So let's um, uh, start with the historical aspect um, of, of the Armenian people. And as I said, this is an important aspect because Armenians have a long historical memory. We'll see this again in a moment, too. Things that happened a thousand years ago, they don't speak about the way we would things happening a thousand years ago. They talk about things that happened a thousand, fifteen hundred years ago as though they happened yesterday. Um, this is part of their historical memory. Any, any people who have a long history in this sense, as a community, share this sort of experience. They're not unique in this, but it is a characteristic um, of theirs. Secondly, I like to emphasize that the genocide is a defining moment in Armenian history, not the defining moment. Right? It's a defining moment, and obviously it has tremendous impact for Armenian self-awareness and self-consciousness today. It has a tremendous impact on how we understand uh, current geopolitical um, 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 positions, but it's not the defining moment of Armenian existence. The genocide does not summarize everything that um, has happened to Armenians. Right? As I say, the genocide is not the culmination of Armenian history. There's a tendency, um, not just in Armenian studies, but in, in, I think in any study having to deal with the genocide, as looking um, at history teleologically. That is, we all know it's going to end with the genocide, and so we build a narrative of the entire history leading up to that moment. Um, that's not what happened historically, obviously, and we, we know that. Nobody knew it was going to end there. Um, but it's always important to keep in mind that, you know, obviously in a lecture about the genocide, we try to push things in that direction, but we should always keep in mind that there were many paths possible throughout the historical process, right? And none of this was necessarily inevitable, okay? Nor can we look at the history necessarily through the lens of what we know what's going to happen. And likewise, it's not the end of history. We're now entering a new phase uh, within Armenian existence uh, and where they should go from now. I will also say that I will not show many pictures from the Armenian Genocide. And this is um, um, primarily uh, to try and avoid a very common and, and um, I would say, mistake 
uh, though it's innocent usually, and that's the objectification of the victims. Um, we, we show these pictures over and over again, and, it, and they do, I mean, they, obviously they reveal a lot about what happened. They're important sources of documentation of testimony. But I often feel like we become voyeuristic when we do that. Um, we start looking at the dead bodies. Um, I do have a couple of pictures on there because it should be shown. Um, but I don't want to fetishize it in any sense. And I also want everybody to remember that what we're dealing with here are not corpses, but people. And that these were living human beings. And that we're not just looking at a, a, a complete group of victims. Uh, that they had an existence of their own. So that I try to minimize the amount of uh, gory uh, sort of pictures. I have more pictures about Armenian life than I do about Armenian death. Uh, I'll just put it that way. Okay. Geography. Here, <laughs> you're probably having a hard time looking on the map, is the Republic of Armenia as it is today. As you can see, it's bordered by the Republic of Georgia to the north, the Republic of Azerbaijan to the east, Republic of Turkey to the west, and the Republic of Iran um, to the south. Not the easiest part of the world uh, to live in. Um, its best um, relations are actually with the Republic of Iran um, and with Russia to the north. Um, in, in the region, those are its two uh, probably... Uh, best allies. And again, uh, you can understand that this is not uh, an easy situation to be in. Um, there's been a blockade on Armenia, um, particularly a very harsh um, fuel embargo uh, implemented by Turkey and Azerbaijan, usually with Georgia involved as well. Um, and it, this created severe um, conditions in the Republic of Armenia to the point where they had to threaten to restart their nuclear reactor um, if fuel wasn't allowed in. Uh, Subsequently, um, a scientific team from the Republic of France, uh, from France came and helped repair the nuclear reactor uh, so that the Armenians wouldn't freeze to death. But here we can see um, today's Armenia. Um, uh, up close, the capital city is here, Yerevan. Uh, you can see it, it too, very close to the border uh, with Turkey. And we can see here another, in, this is a separate republic of Nagorno-Karabakh whose population is Armenian. Um, it was within the uh, Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, but f following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, it um, opted for independence. There was then a huge war in which tens of thousands of people died between um, uh, Azerbaijan and the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, this is still considered one of the hot zones in the world today, um, and people are say, waiting, or at least they're expecting that another conflict will erupt there in the near future. And of course, again, it may seem very far away from here, but when you consider that uh, Azerbaijan um, is normally allied with the Republic of Turkey, Russia is allied with the Republic of Armenia, the United States has dumped a lot of money into uh, Armenia as well, and the Republic of Georgia um, is allied with Turkey and Azerbaijan often, it has the um, makings of starting a regional conflict, which is something obviously the United States wants to avoid. Uh, and we have tried um, unsuccessfully to broker uh, peace negotiations uh, between the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. As it will be bringing, I'll be bringing this up again because part of the reason of the conflict is, is a leftover uh, from the genocide. Okay, so this is the modern republic. I need to do this. This is historical Armenia. And when I say historical Armenia, this was never an actual state the way we would consider it. Um, this is more in terms of the fact of where Armenians were culturally and linguistically dominant um, in, in, in the area um, in, in antiquity uh, through the Middle Ages. Um, as you can see, the total area was approximately 100,000 square miles, slightly bigger than Great Britain. So it was a very large um, area, and Armenians were spread um, throughout it, all the way from Lake Van. Down here was the center of much Armenian culture. Um, uh, into the province of Sunik and up to the borders of Georgia um, in the regions of Gugark. Um, it's a very mountainous uh, area, um, extreme climactic conditions. It's very cold in the winter, very hot in the summer. Um, but uh, it makes for a hardy people. Um, and as you can see, they've, they've never really had an outlet to the sea. Um, for most of its existence, Armenians have been landlocked. Um, and, and today they still are. Their main, um, their main maritime experience, or I should say naval experience, has been on uh, the two major lakes, Lake Van and Lake Sevan, um, which Lake Sevan is still today in the Republic of Armenia. But historic Armenia in that 
to sum up, is about, one, is about 10 times bigger than the present day republic. And here you can see a comparison uh, between the two. Here is the Republic of Armenia and there's uh, historical Armenia. So when we're really, when we're looking at uh, Armenian history prior to the genocide, what we're looking at really is what we would call here, what I call here Eastern Anatolia. Right, the Armenian Plateau plus a little bit more territory outside of the Armenian Plateau. Um, uh, it's the eastern part. Um, it's not only the Republic of Turkey today, it goes out into Armenia and into Azerbaijan. Um, so that entire eastern area of what is known as Anatolia. Okay, so who are the Armenians? The Armenian language, or what we call the Proto-Armenian speakers, uh, we hypothesize entered um, the area. Um, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I can get this. Can you slip that back? Actually, thank you. Enter the, uh, uh, the area that is today Armenia, we suppose around 1200 BCE. Okay, they're Indo European, the language is Indo European, and this was an Indo European group. Um, and they came into the region around Lake Van around that time, where they settled amongst other peoples who were already there, intermarried, um, and, and uh, settled down and created a culture of their own. The Armenian language came to be dominant. And our first historical um, uh, attestation of Armenia as Armenia um, is in the, um, the inscription of Darius the Great, the Achaemenid Shah, some people remember their ancient history in 519 BCE where he talks about sending an Armenian general to Armenia. Um, so this is a, a long um, history of, of settlement and of cultural adaptation in this region. Okay, what are some of these significant factors of Armenian self-identity then? First of all, if we look at the arc of Armenian history, we can see that the periods of autonomy, that's where they were self-ruling, are mixed in with periods of occupation, right, where other peoples ruled them. Um, and they've had an historical experience as both ruler and rule. Right? The other thing is their Christian faith. They were the first nation, so to say, to accept Christianity as their official religion. This is something that they hold on to to this day and they're very proud of. Um, it marks a major part of their identity and we'll be looking at that in a little bit. Language, they have their own language, Armenian, and, they are, and their own alphabet, which was invented in 406. We'll be uh, seeing that in a little bit as well. But that also has played a, a big marker uh, in Armenian self-identity. And then finally, the homeland dispersion. Um, um, dichotomy. That is, they've always had a sense of a homeland, and yet for significant amounts of times they've lived outside of that homeland in various areas throughout the region and now of, um, obviously throughout the world. So we'll be looking at all of these factors briefly because these are important for how an Armenian saw himself, uh, sees himself today, and also how they uh, saw themselves um, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. So as I said, we the uh, Armenians themselves ha have had periods of monarchies. Um, they had several kingdoms all the way through antiquity into what we know as the Middle Ages. Um, as well as in the modern period, they have their own republic, as I've mentioned now. Um, but they've also been occupied by others um, in antiquity uh, as well as in, uh, as in the contemporary situation. Um, the largest extent of Armenian political power uh, to which many Armenians will if you go into an Armenian house, you can often find a portrait of King Tigran the Great. Right? This guy lived, as you can see there, from 95 to 55 BCE was when he ruled. Right? And at that point, his was the largest kingdom in the Middle East, stretching all the way, as you can see, north to where Georgia is, the Caspian Sea, down to the Mediterranean, and possibly even Judea was a tributary of King um, T uh, Tigran the Great for a brief period of time. Um, obviously, this state, um, this large kingdom, uh, roused the, uh, the uh, attentions of Rome, uh, and the Roman Empire was finally able to, um, um, to destroy um, uh, the, the, Rome, you know, the Roman armies were finally able to uh, bring down uh, the Armenian Empire of Tigran. But Armenians to this day know Tigran the Great. He's someone who's familiar to Armenians and in their conception of their role in the Middle East. Okay? From the 14th century until the founding of the uh, Armenian republics in, in the 20th century, however, Armenians lived under occupation. In the area that we're concerned with, um, this will be the territory of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and we'll be talking about that in a second. But for, for that period, the Ottoman Empire um, basically took over Armenia in the 15th century, and they continued um, to control it down to its dissolution um, at World War I. 
Okay, as I said, faith, um, a very important aspect to Armenian self-identity. Um, Christianity was introduced early into Armenia. We have evidence for Christian communities by the third century. Um, early in the fourth century, uh, the king, um, uh, Tirdat, uh, was converted, as you can see here, uh, Saint Gre- by Saint Gregory the Illuminator. Here he is converting uh, King Tirdat in a manuscript illumination. And the Armenian kingdom became the first kingdom to officially make Christianity its religion. Not just the religion of the king, but the king said this is going to be the religion of the people as well. And then there was a process of conversion that took a while, um, but eventually did manage um, to uh, convert the country. The Armenian church is independent. It's not um, subject to the papacy or the Greek uh, ecumenical patriarch. It has its own head that they call Catholicos. His residence is at Etchmiadzin in the Republic of Armenia today. And theologically, it belongs to a cluster of churches known as the Oriental Orthodox. That is the Armenian church, the uh, West Syriac church, the Coptic church in Egypt, and the Ethiopian church. They share uh, theological simil- similarities, and that's why we group them together. Um, at the moment, the best sort of extra grouping relations are probably with the Roman Catholic Church. Armenians and Roman Catholics um, um, have fairly good relations. Okay. A major episode in Armenian history was the War of 450-451. Um, the Persian Empire decided that the Armenians needed to revert back to their pre-Christian religion, and they in- launched a major invasion of the country. Um, Vartan Mamagonian, the general-in-chief of the Armenian forces, along with other nobles, resisted um, this uh, forcible reconversion, um, and uh, they launched a series of guerrilla attacks, finally meeting the Persian army um, on the plain of Avarayr on June 2nd, 451. Um, There are wonderful descriptions of this historically, particularly as the Persians came with elephants um, that that the Armenians had to defeat. Um, and the Armenian ar- army was utterly destroyed. Um, Vartan himself was killed. Most of the Armenian army was killed. But they had managed to kill so many Persians in the process that it became a Pyrrhic victory. The, even though the Persians won that battle, they had to retreat afterwards to return to Persia. Right? And finally, in 485, um, uh, Christianity was accepted by the Persian Empire in Armenia. They said, okay, you could be Christian. Now, I mention this... Um, partially because of its historical interest, but this again is something that people remember to this day. On Thursday, this Thursday is the Feast of St. Vartanans, is the Feast of Vartanans, of this battle. This is a battle that's commemorated to this day. I don't know how many of you here commemorate a battle that's 1,600 years old on a regular basis, all right? And for them, as I said, it's like it happened. I mean, I don't even, we don't even do anything for the Revolutionary War. I mean, I would say most of us, I don't go out anytime, you know, with a musket or anything like that. <laughs> My daughter, who goes to Armenian school, dresses up as Saint Vartan, comes out with a sword and shield, and recites poetry in praise of their defense of Christianity at this, uh, at this battle. Okay, so on Thursday is the liturgical celebration. The main cathedral in New York is named Sur Vartan, Saint Vartan's, after him. The people who died in the genocide are often classed together with the people who died during this war. So we can see that that memory, that historical memory of dying for the faith as well, is something that persevered over 1,600 years uh, of history and is still very, very much present uh, today. And people will talk about this war within the same breath of the genocide. These are, these are linked in many respects in many people's minds. Okay, so this, that battle, as I said, helped um, consolidate an Armenian Christian identity. From this point on, Christianity in, our, in Relative Christianity and Armenianness almost become inseparable. Right? For, to be Armenian means to be Christian. If you convert to Islam, you're no longer Armenian. Right? You're not just changing religions, you change ethnicity. In that sense, it, it becomes sort of like Judaism is, um, as an ethno-religious identity. Um, as I said, the battle is still revered to this day. And here's a painting done in 1953 um, about the battle to show that it is still very much living. Okay. There's a picture of the Armenian alphabet uh, on the right. The uh, alphabet was invented in 406 uh, by St. Mesrop Mashtots. has 36 letters. Its original purpose was to translate the Bible. As I said, the Christianity is very important to their culture. Um, there was a translation movement and an immediate native literature. They started writing their own histories and their own works immediately after the invention of the alphabet. 
But this means we also have a 1600 year old literary tradition in Armenia. Okay? That's a huge tradition. Lots of works, lots of literature. Okay? This is a people that have a long right, and culturally active history. And as I said, here's the, um, um, uh, the, the capital letters as they uh, were made in the, in, the, uh, in the fifth century. Okay, dispersion. Armenians always travel. Right? We know this. I mean, much like other people in antiquity, they traveled around for business purposes uh, as well as for military purposes. They were renowned for their military skill, particularly for their cavalry um, abilities, and many empires used them in their, in their battles and sent them all over. There were Armenians in southern Italy. There were Armenians stationed all the way near China. I mean, they, they got around. But... Political circumstances, particularly between the 11th and 15th centuries, encourage a greater amount of dispersion uh, around the region, particularly throughout the Middle East. Um, and between the, uh, uh, the, the invasions uh, of the Seljuk Turks and then later Ottoman expansion, and then uh, wars between um, in the Ottomans and the Safavids um, in the 17th and 18th centuries um, proved uh, particularly um, uh, damaging uh, to the Armenians. As you can see, for most, for most of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, the border between the Iranian world and the Turkish world was drawn right through Armenia. Okay? So this meant that whenever these two armies fought, they fought on Armenian soil. Whether Armenians were fighting or not, they were caught in between. And this also encouraged a lot of people uh, to move around the region, uh, not just around the region, but around the world, as we'll see. By the 17th to 18th centuries, Armenians were, throughout the Ottoman Empire, what we call Western Turkey, Constantinople in particular, the Levant, right, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel today, Egypt, and Iraq. They were all throughout the Persian Empire, particularly in uh, Nujulfa, which is outside of Isfahan in the south of Iran today. There was a large community in Ethiopia, Russia, Georgia, Eastern Europe, there were communities in the Ukraine, Poland, Romania, and Western Europe, Italy, France, England, Holland, and Belgium. In most of these places, they often set up printing presses as well. And they were vital in the communication networks and trading networks of the day. Not only there, but we have them in East Asia, in India, Burma, China, Tibet, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Right? And a couple even made it to America. They didn't stay, but we have Martin Yee Armenian. I love that guy's name. Martin Yee Armenian, who came to Jamestown, 16, 18, 19, way before any of my ancestors ever touched American soil. And also George the Armenian, who came later. They didn't actually wind up staying. Um, they were there mainly to do a tobacco uh, business, import and export, but it didn't succeed, and so they, uh, they returned uh, back to the old world. But, but we can see... Right? Armenians, I mean, look at that. I mean, that's an impressive um, dispersion. And again, they're able to maintain their identity through their faith, their maintenance of a historical memory, and their language. Right? So it's not just that they went these places and completely assimilated, they adapted. Right? They didn't assimilate normally, they adapted. Now, why is this important? One, they were able to take advantage of one of the uh, major developments of what we call early modern history, and that is what we now call the process of globalization. Right? After the discovery of the New World, um, uh, the world itself rapidly became much more closely knit. Right? As we can see, this, I mean, today it's incredibly closely knit, but this process goes back basically beginning with 1500 onwards. And Armenians being throughout the world in these communities were able to take advantage to that, right, of, of that situation. And so they were able to set up trading networks uh, as well as cultural context, contacts. They were aware of what was going on in Europe, philosophically, intellectually. They're aware of what's going on in India, politically and economically. And they're communicating uh, with each other through their language. Right? And it's also important that they weren't colonialists. Right? They didn't have any power, military power, to back them usually. Wherever they went, they established themselves within the community and were able to establish one-on-one -on -one contacts. Unlike the British, who normally went on top and were able to impose what they wanted on the bottom, the Armenians were normally um, able to act as the go-betweens because they had established contacts in the region itself. Okay. And 
This obviously led to the financial um, improvement of the community as a whole, right, overall. So financially, some Armenians begin to prosper in the cities of the Ottoman Empire. So if, um, and uh, sorry, I also want to say, it gave, gave them a global perspective, and this is also important. When they're looking at themselves and their role as a community within the region and within the world, they're not just looking at, this is my town. I mean, obviously some people are, but you also have a number of people who are not just saying, this town, this village. They're able to see it throughout a much larger uh, context of Europe and the Far East and the entire connectivity between, the, uh, between all those areas. So let's look, what I want to uh, share now is what it may have been like to have been an urban, relatively affluent Armenian in the middle of the 19th century, right, in the Ottoman Empire. So let's look at an Armenian in Constantinople in 1860. Okay, this is um, roughly 55 years before the genocide. This was a time of hope, excitement, and change. If you wanted to be an Armenian, this, in, in an urban setting, this was the time when you wanted to live. Right? This was in a really a dynamic and an energetic um, a moment for the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire particularly. Internal and external pressures on the empire had brought about certain reforms. These in Turkish were known as Tanzimat. Right? But they were meant to um, give the minorities in the Ottoman Empire uh, a certain amount of financial as well as material security. Right? The right to life, the right to own property, uh, the right in some ways uh, uh, to be able to live one's own life. Um, it gave them a certain amount of rights and it extended to them uh, a certain amount of economic security that they had not had prior to this. So this opened up a, a huge avenue um, uh, for minorities, uh, whether they be Christians, the Armenians and Greeks in particular, or Jews, um, the other major uh, minority community, um, to make uh, inroads financially and socially within the Ottoman Empire. Um, these reforms, as I said, were meant to increase education, trade, and protect the life and property of all subjects regardless of faith. Previous to this, this had not been the case. Uh, and so they were really second-class citizens. This, this does not mean that this brought them up to the level of equality that we would, we would sort of identify with today, but it certainly created an atmosphere um, in urban environments of a greater amount of uh, equality and a greater opportunity for these minorities. And we have to remember that in these urban uh, uh, areas, we have an incredible amount of diversity, linguistic and ethnic. We have Turkish, Greek, Armenian, Ladino. I don't know if anybody here um, who's Jewish may know Ladino. It's the language, it's the language that the Jews who had been expelled from Spain took with them um, to the Ottoman Empire when the Ottoman Empire took them in after they had been expelled. And they've maintained it um, to this day. I mean, they had. Um, uh, uh, they had newspapers in Ladino as well as in Armenian. Uh, there's some wonderful Ladino music too, um, as well as um, uh, Greek Oriental Rebetica from, from the area. But what we're talking about is an incredibly diverse region. Many languages, many different peoples. If you were the average Armenian in 1860, you spoke three languages. Right? Greek, I mean, sorry, Armenian, right? Turkish, and then probably French or at least one of these other uh, languages if you were educated. So this was a cosmopolitan society. Um, urban society was quite, um, uh, many aspects of it were quite wealthy. Here we can see a famous Armenian hotel in Constantinople, the Tokatlian. Um, it was mentioned in Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express. That's how most people know it. Uh, but you can see that they, they reached a rather high um, um, standard of economic well-being. So we see a wealthy and middle class emerging and amongst the Armenians at this time. They had positions in the government. They were superintendents of the imperial mint and imperial architects. If you look at most of the major mosques and palaces of the 18th and 19th centuries, Armenians had designed them. All right. uh, so they were respected within the empire and they served vital functions within the empire. For example, they controlled gunpowder and paper mills. Again, an absolutely essential um, um, uh, industries for the functioning uh, of the empire. They were educated at, to a level that was unheard of previously. Uh, Armenians studied in Europe in the 1840s. If you're from an upper middle class uh, background, a lot of them were sent to Armenian schools in, in, in France and in, in Venice, in Italy. Um, plus, there were colleges opening up in the western part of the empire um, and in cities in, Armenian, in the Armenian provinces. 
Uh, one of the couple of most famous ones were Robert College, um, the Euphrates College, and the Anatolia College. Um, the last two being in uh, historical Armenia, today uh, Eastern Turkey. Um, these were done mainly by Protestant missionaries right, that brought with them Western standards of education and most importantly educated women. Again, something completely unheard of and something that is Muslim women in the empire couldn't take advantage of. This was something that became reserved for Christian minorities in the empire that their women became educated. But these are also many of them, particularly in Constantinople, later came um, to the United States. Some of the ones that I know of became some of the first graduates of Radcliffe College of Harvard University. Right? They went on to careers here in the United States and also inculcated a, a, a major um, uh, impact in terms of their children going to college. College for them was not something then strange for when they came to America, but part of their own um, uh, experience. Uh, so you have a very highly educated um, uh, female class of Armenians that um, would uh, come out uh, from the Ottoman Empire. And this is also a period of cultural renaissance, right? That they call it in Armenian Zartonk, awakening, right? There are newspapers, literary journals, and translations of European uh, literature, unheard of. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of volumes. And we're not talking about a large number of people here, but they were active, incredibly active. And they most, they, a lot of this stuff they translated twice, first into classical Armenian, um, their, their liturgical language, and then when they realized, well, maybe they should keep up with the times, into modern Armenian, the language that people spoke on the street. And this starts to become a literary language at this time. We have two major dialects, Western and Eastern Armenian, but th it's really right around this period, in 1860, that we have the emergence of it as a literary language as well. First Armenian theater, producing Armenian plays, first uh, in the Ottoman Empire, 1861. And they write their own constitution based on uh, uh, models from Europe right, for the internal workings of their community. Right? Again, a highly educated, in-touch um, uh, community right, that was vibrant and active. So how do we go from here? A rather wealthy, well-to-do uh, family, that is um, completely ensconced within Ottoman society in 1860 to here, within just a generation. This is one of the big questions that really haunts um, Armenians to this day. Right? Because all of them will talk about how they were wealthy in, in the Ottoman Empire, how they had had active full lives, how people were engaged in there, and at the same time how this sort of atrocity happened and came by surprise. So the question that a lot of people struggle with is how did they go from what was once termed the loyal millet, and the millet was the, the ethno-religious groupings of the Ottoman Empire, how did they go from the loyal minority group to the group that needed to be exterminated? First of all, what we need to look at is the difference between the urban Armenian and what is going on in the actual provinces. Okay, there were six Armenian provinces um, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, right? and the mass of these Armenians were agricultural peasants. Okay, even though the Protestant missionaries had reached there and they had become more educated than they had in the past, the majority of Armenians living in these areas uh, were not wealthy uh, merchants, but the majority of them were uh, agricultural peasants. The reforms that had helped Armenians so much in the urban areas particularly in the western part of the empire, were not really enforced in the eastern part of the empire. That is, it was fine, you, you had the right to, to own property in the, in, in, western, in the western part of the empire, and if anybody tried to take it away from you, you could appeal to the authorities. In the east, nobody knew. Right? Sometimes it would be enforced, sometimes it wouldn't be enforced. It was up to the individual people who were in power there. We weren't talking about a strong... Um, implementation of these reforms in that part uh, of the empire. And the Armenians talk about having a sense of lawlessness and abandonment. Right? That um, the locals were able to take advantage of themselves, uh, sorry, were able to take advantage of the Armenians and they were looking for ways to protect themselves from this situation because the central authorities weren't doing anything to help them. Plus we had the demographic problem. While the Armenians were a majority in Van, 
and a plurality in most of the other provinces, provinces, right? In some areas, they were the minority, and that obviously made them more vulnerable as well. Right? Having um, being surrounded by uh, uh, others who were more numerous than they were, particularly Kurds, but also Turks, um, it, it left them exposed. We already see signs of trouble in the relationship between uh, the Ottoman Empire and its non-Muslim subjects in, in the early 19th century. Um, first of all, there was a series of military defeats that the Ottoman Empire um, experienced in the 18th and 19th century that had given it a defensive posture. Um, uh, they, were, uh, they were very much on guard um, and worried about their status in the region. Right? Mainly, their, their, uh, one of their preoccupations was with an expanding Russian empire. Russia was really coming to its, grand, uh, its height at this moment and was pushing on uh, uh, Ottoman borders, uh, particularly from uh, in the east, over here, as you can see through Armenia, but also over here in the west as well. Uh, and so this Russian pressure on, on the Ottoman Empire was something that they felt acutely. Right? And their loss in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 was humiliating to them. Uh, Russia was able to make huge inroads into the eastern part of the empire over here and take over um, a large amount of area. Much of that territory had to be um, returned um, in the peace treaty, but nonetheless, um, it, it was a humiliating defeat uh, for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they were having problems competing in the international economy. They had to take out foreign loans. Overall, we get a sense that many of them may have felt as though the status of the empire was declining and that they were being held at sort of the whim of European Christian powers. Right? <laughs> And many of the reforms that had been um, uh, enacted helped, although they helped minorities, it often created a backlash, right? All of a sudden, people, local Muslims who had been at the top of the pecking order, now see the pecking order realigning itself, start saying, why is this happening? This is still an Islamic state. Why are we going down and they're going up? Right? We have reasons uh, uh, to preserve our superior standing within the empire, where its backbone, we're the ones who make it up, so we should be defending our privileges. Uh, and so in many areas, although these in, uh, reforms were announced, the local population uh, really wasn't happy with them at all and acted and sort of created a backlash in which they responded much more harshly than they had in, in prior times. Following the, the, the loss of the Russo-Turkish War, the Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, starts to turn against the Armenian um, uh, uh, population in particular. There were Armenian generals, um, as part of Armenia was within Russian territory, there were Armenian generals who fought for the Russian side. Um, some Armenians on the border areas had welcomed the invading uh, Russian Empire as liberators, uh, as Christian liberators. Um, and this started to create a sense of distrust on the part uh, of, the, of the Ottoman government, and in particular of uh, the Ottoman Sultan. And this is important. Because it's from this period, although it is not Abdul Hamid II who will perpetrate the Armenian Genocide, it's from this period that the idea of scapegoating the Armenians becomes quite prevalent. And it's an ideology he helped develop uh, and he promulgated. And between 1895 and 96, Abdul Hamid worried over the situation in Eastern Anatolia launches a series of attacks uh, on the Armenian population there in which between 100 and 200,000 Armenians are killed. Um, this was the first um, sort of inkling that things were not all well within the Ottoman Empire. The earliest Armenian communities uh, in America really stemmed from the aftermath of this, uh, of this massacre as people started to leave the empire realizing this is not a place to grow up. A lot of parents sent their children away, saying this cannot bode well for the future. Right? And so many, and many people survived, actually, if they had gotten through the massacres of 1895-96. They survived in the diaspora because they had left thinking that this was um, a, a really an omen, an ill omen for the future. Uh, tens of thousands of Armenians, as I said. Okay, and by this point, it's not just the Armenians. By the 1890s, others were starting to get fed up with the Ottoman um, system. Um, they're known generally as the Young Turks, as an umbrella group that included Armenians as well as Turks, but other members of the empire, particularly Arabs, 
um, as well, who, and, and some Greeks, who were tired of this despotic, tyrannical regime that Abdul Hamid II had, um, uh, had sort of uh, enacted. Uh, by 1899, even his own nephew, Prince Sabah Adin, had joined this movement. Um, this idea that we need to have, he was in favor of having some sort of constitutional uh, monarchy. Right? You would retain the Sultanate, the, uh, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, but there would be a more democratic parliamentary system underneath it. The Sultan, obviously, was not in favor of this at all. Um, and finally, um, as we'll see, would lead to a, a revolution. But a major step along that way happened in 1907 when a nationalist faction of this young Turk movement, these were um, uh, Turks um, who believed in Turkey for Turks um, and in believed in a notion of pan-Turkism, uh, that is the idea that all Turks throughout the world should be united, sort of merged with military factions uh, within the empire. That is, there were certain military leaders, particularly in the Balkans, who had felt that the Ottoman Empire was losing its prestige and that they hoped that they could reinvigorate the empire right, with a new governmental system in which they had aligned themselves with these nationalist Turks. Uh, and they formed um, this organization known as the, uh, the Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP. And he, the, the ideological forefather of this, uh, or let's say leading light of this organization was Zia Gukalk. And he wrote um, uh, poetry and treatises in favor of this pan-Turkic idea, that the Turks needed to reinvigorate this idea of a grand Turkic empire that stretched all the way from the Pacific to the Mediterranean, right? hearkening back to the old days when they controlled the uh, entire um, Central Asian uh, plateau. So they uh, stepped there. So they, they started following the writings uh, of, uh, of Zia Gukalp, um, in, in their own um, sort of political ideologies. Okay, in 1908 then, they finally able, they succeed in overthrowing Sultan Abdul Hamid II. And I have to say, if you look at 1908 again, you're thinking, things are finally on the right path. We've averted the, the, the disaster. Armenians flocked back to the, uh, uh, to the Ottoman Empire. The young Turks set up a constitutional government. Uh, Armenians participated in it. Right? They were active in the government. And as I said, many Armenians returned. Some of famous Armenian poets uh, returned as educators. They had been living in Europe ever since the, uh, the Hamidian massacres. And now they thought they could come back right, after 1908 to run schools, to help in the rebuilding of the Armenian community, to help strengthen the Ottoman Empire. And they all thought of themselves as Ottoman subjects in this way. Um, but there were problems that were still lurking, despite the fact that they had um, uh, uh, overthrown the Sultan and, uh, and, and created this constitutional government. These first came out in the uh, Ottoman massacres of 1909. Or according to the New York Times, uh, in the month of April and May, between 20,000 and 30,000 Armenians were killed uh, in, this er in this area of, uh, on, on the Mediterranean where Turkey sort of cuts down into the Levant uh, in Syria today. On this area here, um, uh, there were a series of, of massacres in which tens of thousands of Armenians were killed. Um, the local uh, Committee of Union and Progress party organization seems to have been involved Particular, uh, particularly within uh, stirring up anti-Armenian sentiment in the newspapers, right? The government, the, the actual central government in Constantinople blamed reactionary forces. Now here is where the crux of the problem sort of rests. They did, um, they, they, they wound up hanging 124 Muslims and seven Armenians for inciting violence in these massacres. They did la launch an investigation. The government and most of the Ottoman Empire decried what happened. But they didn't go down to look into what were the root causes of the animosity between the communities. By blaming it on reactionary forces, they sort of brushed the whole in incident under the rug, saying, yeah, there's not an actual systemic problem in the relationship between uh, Armenians and Turks in this region, or between Armenians and the Muslim population in this region. Right? This is just sort of a blip, right? and it's not going to happen again. Now, in 1913, the Committee for Union and Progress as a party takes advantage of 
several uh, uh, Turkish losses in the Balkans um, uh, against European countries. And they stage a coup against the constitutional government. And they basically take over uh, the Ottoman government. Uh, their, its leaders were Enver, the Minister of War, Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior, and Cemal Pasha, the Minister of the Navy. And these are the three who are what we also call the architects of the Armenian Genocide. The coup was uh, violent in that they executed some members of the cabinet, um, and it was basically um, a, a power grab in which martial law was then uh, imposed afterwards. So there was a suspension of all democratic rights after the, uh, the coup of 1913. Enver in particular, and here he is Enver Pasha, was eager uh, uh, to make uh, territorial gains uh, through war. In particular, they're, 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 we, what we start to see evolve and had been evolving was a symbiosis between Germany and the Ottoman Empire or Germany uh, uh, and, 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 and the Turkish leaders. Germany, having been formed late, was left out of the entire colonialist program that had fed England and France and Spain. And they felt inferior because of this. Since they were unable to take over any other country, they decided to link up with the Ottoman Empire and try and create their own little Middle Eastern sort of colonialist uh, experience. A, a, a railroad was built called the Berlin to Baghdad uh, Railroad that was supposed to help um, in the transportation of material as well as goods and as well as arms and as we'll see as well as Armenians. Um, but they really um, sent people over to the Ottoman Empire to, uh, uh, to train the army, to supply them with weapons. And Enver was anxious at the outset of World War I to join on the side of the Germans Right? in the hopes of actually gaining territorial, territory, particularly against Russia. Okay? The Germany was uh, against Russia, and they were anxious to get in on it. He leads a disastrous campaign um, uh, in the east, and he's defeated by the Russians at the Battle of Sarikamish in January of 1915. Uh, it was freezing cold. He lost several, tens of thousands of men. Um, it was an absolute disaster. But the major aspect of it is when he gets back, he says the reason why he lost was because the Armenians have betrayed him. And this starts the process. Right? And again, here we see something that Sultan Abdul Hamid had already implanted in people's minds. The idea of being able to use the Armenians as a scapegoat for other things that are going wrong with the empire. And so very soon afterwards, we start uh, uh, see seeing, being put into motion, the actual genocidal process. In February of 1915, the Armenians, who since 1908 uh, were able to legally bear arms, uh, were now disarmed. They had been fighting in the Ottoman army for the Ottoman Empire. Now they were disarmed and they were used only for work details, right, so that they could save their donkeys, is, what, is, is how that they put it. Right? In April 8th, the Armenians of the town of Zaytun were forcibly uh, deported. Zaytun had been a problematic area. The Armenians there were quite um, resilient uh, to any sort of uh, larger government imposition. Uh, but they, in, in April, uh, had been forcibly deported from their town. Um, and in April, uh, April 19th, uh, the Armenians of the Van region um, uh, were massacred uh, by Ottoman troops. Finally, on April 24th, and this is, some of you may know, this is the date we actually uh, use to commemorate the Armenian Genocide. All the intellectual leaders of Constantinople, religious leaders, writers, political leaders, were rounded up and arrested. Um, they thought that the, the, the wisest policy would be to cut off the head and then the body would follow. Most of them uh, were executed. Only a few of them managed to survive. And by 1916, over one million people had been killed and 500,000 people had been displaced from their homes. It was very quick. Um, the majority of the murder happened between April and August. About 800,000 people died. That, and I think I was, we were doing the numbers at uh, a conference and it was, it's roughly at the same rate as was happening in Rwanda um, uh, 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 more, more recently. Um, it's, it's tens of thousands a month. Uh, by 1923, um, when we sort of, you know, these are in some senses arbitrary dates, but by 1923, 1 1.5 million um, people uh, are, are presumed to have died. 
uh, and, and as well several hundred thousand again displaced. The thing now, the main question is here is not just the numbers. I mean, we have the numbers and the numbers are actually accepted by most uh, scholars, even denialist scholars, as we'll talk about in a second, have started to accept the numbers. A Turkish scholar in Turkey who denies the fact that the Armenian Genocide happened notes that 800,000 people disappeared off the tax payroll in 1915. Um, and he just says that it wasn't genocide. So, the, the thing that is, matters, people will say, it's not just numbers that make a genocide. There's a paradigm. Right? First of all, there was a pattern to the extermination. Men were gathered, right? the men in the villages were gathered, held, and then marched out of town. Usually a short distance away from the town, um, they were shot um, uh, uh, or at bayoneted to save bullets and then dumped into a mass grave. The women and children and the elderly uh, were the next to go and they were told they would have to evacuate their homes. A lot of them were nervous right, about leaving, so they said, okay, why don't you have a, one contingent of you go first and when they get to the next town, they'll write back to say it's okay. And that's what happened. They would go to the next place. They would write back, say it was okay. Then they were led out of town and executed. And the next people were um, executed after they had been um, forcibly uh, ridden through their uh, towns. Now, m many of them were marched through the desert um, down uh, uh, towards Aleppo. And uh, people may be familiar with it uh, more now, considering the events of going on in, in, in Syria. Right? And then along the Euphrates to places like Deir Zor. Um, that should be right here, right? which was, now there's a town there, but in those days there, uh, it was uh, absolute desert. Uh, we have one survivor's uh, account where the children were all uh, thrown into caves. Uh, there were these caves and the children were all rounded up and thrown in there. Then gasoline was poured into all of them. The caves were set on fire and then rocks were pulled on, uh, put, put on top of them. They caused uh, uh, them to be um, sealed in. Uh, seven, there were about 250 children to whom this was done, they said, and, about, and seven of them survived by climbing to the top and drinking um, uh, the, the condensation that formed on the top of the rocks. They managed to survive. Um, and they finally dug themselves out after seven days in the cave um, and, and marched and to uh, the town. Uh, and they still have descendants living in the town today. They, they went back and found one of them who never left then, stayed in Deir Zor. Um, after that, some of them, uh, a couple of the other ones managed to get out of I think one of them went to Australia um, eventually. Uh, but that was uh, one of the ways uh, people were executed. There are, of course, also stories of them, um, of Turkish shoulders uh, betting on pregnant women, whether the child was a male or a female, and then slicing them open to see uh, uh, who won the bet. Um, throwing babies up in the air and catching them on their bayonet was also a common uh, practice, uh, but mostly most people died just by being marched around and around in circles in this desert in the heat without proper food or clothing or water. And uh, even the many of the people, uh, some of the we have accounts by some of the uh, soldiers who were leading them on this march, right? Who, for example, we have one Arab um, commander who was writing saying, "Where the hell am I going?" You keep on sending me around and around in the desert, and I need, I need to know where I'm taking these people. They're dropping like flies. And they said, just keep walking until they all, um, until most people collapsed uh, from exhaustion. Um, in, in places along the Euphrates, um, people at the time said that it actually changed its course because of the number of people who had died and, and thrown themselves into the river or had just um, uh, died crossing the river. Um, it actually diverted its course, and that the river ran red from the blood that was in there uh, for several days. So it was, um, it was obviously a, a horrific event um, in which uh, these people were murdered. So we have the pattern to the extermination, which is one aspect of it, and the simultaneity. As I said, most of the killing happened between April and August. Right? This was not some long, drawn-out process uh, uh, that happened slowly. It was very clear that, the, majority, that the, the government wanted the majority of these people eliminated right away. Uh, so between uh, April and August, uh, the Armenians of nearly every major town and village uh, had been deported. Not, and this occurred not just on, six, not, not just on the border region, regions. One of the um, 
uh, we'll see one of the denialist tactics is to say, well, they were being relocated from the zone of warfare. Right? This, this was actually a humanitarian act. Right? These were civilians that were going to be caught between the Russians and the Turks in the fighting, and so they had to be evacuated because we didn't want them caught in between. That doesn't help explain why people in the center of the country were also being de deported. And how come just the Armenians? And why weren't they trying to save the Turkish and the Arab and the Kurdish um, um, uh, populations as well? Um, so this happened throughout um, the empire and not just, and throughout the, particularly the six provinces, not just on the border regions. Um, Early uh, deportations occurred in Van, in Van and Erzurum, which are nowhere, or not that near to the border. Right? Um, again, we can see that there was a methodical process to it. There was a southern detachment that hit the cities in the south, and a northern uh, detachment that hit the cities in the north. This was not random. Right? This was programmatic. Right? And there were also cities that are not even in historical Armenia. We also have um, the denigration that has now become common amongst uh, 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 perpetrators of, uh, of genocide. The Armenians were depicted as a disease, as a vermin, something corrupting the Ottoman Empire that needed to be eliminated, that needed to be gotten rid of. Right? It had to be, you had to cleanse yourself of this element in your society. And for the first time, and really this is why I think scholars start to call it the, the first genocide of the 20th century, we see the use of modern technology. Now obviously this was not on the scale that we would later see um, uh, in the Holocaust, but still the rudimentary elements of it. The telegraph, which had been recently brought to the Ottoman Empire, was used to communicate orders, right, so that they could get there right away. This helps, this is why the simultaneity was even possible. They could, they could telegraph their orders, right? And the new railway lines that had been um, uh, built by the Germans and the Ottoman Empire was able to use uh, were able to be used to transport Armenians into the desert and then dump them along on the side of the road. They too often, uh, and people may be familiar with this story, often they were asked to buy their tickets on these trains before they were put on them. Um, and then they were just let off in the middle of the desert and executed. Um, so again, we can see uh, what would be, become, I would think, uh, even more familiar uh, in the Holocaust but some, uh, some foreshadowing of these later technologies. And I also like to no mention, during this, there were German soldiers who were stationed in the Ottoman Empire. Some of them witnessed th this and later wound up working in concentration camps during World War II. And they, they made a direct link. They saw what they were doing with the Jews as something as completely analogous to what the Turks had done with the Armenians, just better, right? They were German, so they could do it in a better fashion. Um, and, and so we see this. The other, I would say, historical irony here is that Germany suppressed knowledge of it. They were getting reports that this was happening, but the German government repressed uh, or suppressed the evidence of the Armenian genocide from its own public because they were afraid that if Germans heard what was being done in the Ottoman Empire, they, were, they would revolt against Germany because they were allies. The, the Germans were too civilized to be able to understand this sort of action. Um, and it, it's, it's frightening to think then in just uh, 30 years later, they too would be wrapped up in this sort of fanaticism. Um, and finally, we can see, also notice that Armenians were gathered in concentration camps like Derizor that became giant holding, again, and not uh, completely identical to the concentration camps of World War II, but eerie, uh, I would say, premonitions of what would happen uh, in World War II. So let's talk about the immediate legacy of, uh, of the genocide. First of all, obviously, it destroyed a vital cultural and economic um, sector of the Middle East and of Anatolia. Okay? A, a group of people who had been there for 3,000 years, had been culturally active, had participated in the life of the Ottoman Empire, had contributed to it economically as well as culturally, was now eliminated. All right? This was a loss uh, for the region. Uh, the other... Uh, half of it is that it caused the Armenian diaspora. And you can see here in this map um, uh, distribution of Armenians throughout the globe as far as we can tell uh, in relative numbers. The darker colors being uh, having the most uh, Armenians, the lighter colors um, having far less. But you can see they're in, on every continent except Antarctica, though there may be one there. Anyway, <laughs> we just don't know it yet. Um, right? But because although Armenians have had this historical experience of dispersion, Right? But the diaspora as we know it today and in the numbers that we have it today are the direct result of the genocide. Um, 
Plus, we have to say the part of the other uh, uh, immediate legacy was the economic basis for the modern Republic of Turkey. Um, and this, again, is, is important to counter denialist claims that try to say, well, it was the Ottoman Empire. It has nothing to do with Turkey today. Right? As, as though you could say that, oh, it's, you know, it was the Third Reich and it has nothing to do with Germany today. Well, that would be fine. And indeed, the people who are there today are not the people who had perpetrated the genocide. But what happened to all the property that Armenians owned? What happened to all the money they had acquired? What happened to all the factories they were running? Those were legally appropriated by the Turkish government and then redistributed uh, to Turkish uh, uh, citizens. And this is important because the genocide, therefore, provides one of the uh, economic bases for the modern Republic of Turkey. And as much as we don't see a continuation of the people, right, the actual state, just like modern Germany, is based upon this activity as well. Right? And that has to be appreciated. I mean, obviously, Germany has done a wonderful job in terms of trying to understand what happened in its past. Turkey, unfortunately, can, we can't say it has uh, tried to do the same. Okay, how about the immediate legacy in the United States? Because this obviously had a big impact in the States. All right? Because you'll often hear, well, you know, the reason why you don't learn about it in high school is because we didn't know about it. It happened all the way over in the uh, Ottoman Empire. You know, it's not like in World War II where there were uh, American troops right there who saw what was going on. The Americans, you know, we as Americans didn't know what was happening. It was all confused. Well, that wasn't the case. Actually, Americans were much better informed about it then than you are today. Um, uh, nearly 200 articles appeared in the New York Times alone between 1915 and 1922. Uh, plus, uh, the uh, uh, American ambassador to Turkey, Henry Morgenthau, whose family, whose descendants, by the way, are still very much active in trying to get recognition for the Armenian Genocide, wrote tons of reports, pages and pages of reports of what was going on. Our, America was a neutral country in world, for most of World War I, and he wasn't able to actually do anything. Uh, with, uh, uh, with the Ottoman Empire, but he does, his account uh, provides a, l a wealth of information for us to know what happened uh, in, most of the, uh, in most of the Ottoman Empire. And he's very clear that what was going on was, as you can see here, uh, a policy of extermination. This was not just a policy of relocation uh, or a policy of selective punishment. This was a policy of extermination. Also in, in response was founded the Committee for Relief in the Near East, which still exists today as the Near Eastern Relief Fund. Right? And between 1916 and 1930, the U.S. raised $116 million in relief money. That equals 1.5 billion U.S. dollars today. That is the largest humanitarian effort ever launched. And nobody told you about it. The United States took a tremendous role afterwards and we don't tell ourselves that we did this. Presidents were involved, right? Politicians, celebrities. People probably don't know that Babe Ruth auctioned his baseball bat in order to get money to help the Armenians, right? Um, silent movie stars were involved. I mean, it's incredible the amount of attention and the amount of good that America did in response to that. But because of our own selective memory, we not only silence what happened to the Armenians. We silence what good we did as a nation and something we should be proud of. All right. One thing we can say, another legacy that I would like to talk about is the word genocide didn't exist in 1914. Um, I was reading an article the other day which said that because the word genocide didn't exist, it's inappropriate to use that term right, to refer to what happened to the Armenians. And I, I can... I, I'm not one to go against historical anachronisms. I mean, I can understand there's a time and a place, except for the fact that the term was coined by a, a, a Jewish-Polish uh, jurist named Raphael Lemkin in 1944 based on his studies of the Armenian, what happened to the Armenians. All right, so the Armenian case was the foundation between what happened to the Armenians and what his fellow Jews were going through in Poland. Right, he coined the term genocide and wrote an entire study on it. So the term genocide in and of itself is a legacy of what happened to the Armenians. Okay? And his earlier studies on the Armenian genocide actually got him disbarred because of Nazi Germany was very, very aware of the fact that any sort of um, um, evocation of what happened to the Armenians would be held in parallel to what happened to the Jews. Um, uh, so they tried to suppress, and we'll talk about this in a second, they also tried to suppress what happened to the Armenian, Armenians. 
So they said newspaper articles and political papers um, therefore do not use the word, but phrases that try to encompass the atrocity, like mass killing, total annihilation, extinction of a people. And there again is that same uh, newspaper headline, right? They're trying to find a term, because it hadn't been going to explain this phenomenon, because they hadn't seen anything like it. The other legacy is a little bit more depressing, and this is the legacy of silence. While in the 20s and 30s, the Armenian Genocide was well known, beginning in the 30s, we start to see a veil of silence falling on the entire issue. Um, and this ends up with a famous statement by Hitler, not much long afterwards, who says, who after all today speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians? Okay, and, and again, part of the question people raise is, how do we go from having six you know, former presidents, senators, movie stars, um, sports stars, actively engaged in this, having it be on the front pages of the New York, uh, New York Times and of, of newspapers throughout the country for several years, how do you go from that level of knowledge and awareness to this level where somebody can say that, nah, nobody talks about the Armenians anymore. Um, and I also mention this because the same thing is going on today uh, with Rwanda. And, and with, uh, this, is, this is why these things are so important. I'll talk about that again in a little bit. But to us it seems remarkable. How all of a sudden can it be so well known to something that is almost completely forgotten? Well, there are certain things. One is the passage of time. Right, you move one generation away, the people who weren't there, who weren't old enough to have read about it firsthand, it becomes secondhand knowledge, they're not as interested anymore, it's part of history, all right? so it, it tends to recede. Other things obviously took up the attention of American citizens, the Great Depression, then World War II, right? and if we're moving through time, right? in, 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 the, in the Soviet Union, um, Stalin also, uh, forbade any sort of mention of the Armenian Genocide because he thought it would um, uh, raise up nationalist, um, ten, uh, nationalist ideas amongst the Armenians and that they would want to break out of the Soviet Union. So he also squashed any mention of the Armenian Genocide within the Soviet Union. Um, likewise, the Turkish government um, decided to enact a deliberate policy of trying to suppress any um, knowledge of the Armenian Genocide getting out and the U.S. acquiesced in that uh, based on uh, developments of Cold War politics, Turkey became an, I mean, Turkey was wise enough to realize that NATO was the future and that alliances with the United States and Europe were going to be beneficial to it rather than with the Soviet Union. And in order to preserve that sort of alliance with them, we would conveniently forget certain things. Um, and that remains the policy to this day. For, we can already see this happening in 1933. Franz Ver, Verfel published his work of historical fiction, The 40 Days of Musada. This was an international bestseller. It was um, based upon what happened. Um, it's a historical fiction, but the context is of Armenians who were fleeing from Turkish army and had, had uh, established themselves on top of a mountain. They eventually fought off the Turkish army and were rescued by a, a, a French um, naval ship. And he uh, wrote this popular uh, work of historical fiction, which was translated into English, as well as into 34 other languages, was banned, was one of the first books to be indexed in Nazi Germany. Uh, and because of this, it's actually, if anybody goes to Yad Vashem, the Museum of the Holocaust in uh, Jerusalem, uh, there's a copy of, an original copy, a first edition copy of the 40 Days of Musadach in the pit of the burned books. I know that because my, my wife worked on um, preserving it for that, for that exhibit. Okay? It was also a book that um, Israeli settlers had to read right? as, as, to let them, as a reminder of what happened in the Holocaust and what could happen to them in the early state of Israel. So this was part of the Israeli education curriculum. But in Nazi Germany, it had been banned. Right? MGM wanted to make it into a film, major motion movie picture. They like this stuff. It's a great story. Right? Nope. Sorry, it was stopped by the Republic of Turkey and the U.S. State Department. Called up MGM and said, you're not going to make that film. So here we have our own government stopping one of our, our companies from making a film because it would not have pleased uh, the Republic of Turkey. Okay? I like to call that political blackmail, but anyway. There were no memorials in the aftermath of it. I mean, here we get used to it, right? We, I've already talked about Yad Vashem, Holocaust Museum. We know we have Holocaust memorials. Right? In after the Armenian Genocide, this sort of um, aspect wasn't present. There were no memorials, no monuments, 
no commemorations, no speeches, no books. Right? The only people who talked about it were maybe the survivors themselves amongst themselves. And they didn't like it. They didn't even tell their kids. Right? Normally, the, the first generation born in this country to the genocide survivors didn't even know. I mean, they heard something had happened, but they didn't know because their parents were so ashamed of what had happened and so ashamed that they survived right? that they didn't want to talk about it. So there was this whole veil of silence that descended upon it because officially we didn't talk about it, unofficially they didn't talk about it, there was no way of remembering it, right? it started to drift away. Finally, the silence broke, and this is in 1965. This is the watershed year, 50 years um, afterwards. Hopefully, uh, 2015, uh, the centenary will be another watershed year in terms of recognition, but 1965 was the first watershed year, the 50th anniversary. We get mass demonstrations in Yerevan, um, and this was incredible because this was still a crime, right? You, could not, you didn't have the freedom of assembly in the Soviet Union. This was a crime for people to gather in large numbers. Tanks had been called out, the Soviet Air Force had been called out. Right? Still, hundreds of thousands of Armenians went into the streets to um, draw attention to the Armenian Genocide. And, uh, and the Soviet authorities backed down, they let it happen. This kick-started also sentiments around the world, because American Armenians also started saying, if they can do this in the Soviet Union, what the heck are we doing here, where we are allowed to assemble and we're not doing anything? All right. So we get the first Armenian Genocide Memorial completed in Montebello, California in that year, 1965, right? And then we get the Armenian Genocide Memorial built in Yerevan itself, which is still there to this day and also has a museum attached to it. But we start to see this process of remembering, of commemoration, right? of, 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 of trying to bring this back up and of dealing with it psychologically beginning in 1965. More recently, we've been seeing the publication of memoirs, which have been absolutely important, because we have to remember that right now, we're at the, the last survivors are dying off. As we come to 100 years since the genocide, anybody who is old enough to have survived it is dying of old age. All right? And so it's become important to get their stories down. And, and people have been doing that, and, they've been being, and they're being published um, uh, now. So we have um, Armenian Golgotha, the memoir of Grigoris Balakian, uh, was translated uh, and recently published. This was written in 1922. He was a priest who managed to get, uh, uh, to get out. Um, he then became um, uh, a bishop in Marseille in France, and he wrote down his own experiences uh, in, uh, during the genocide. Uh, we also have uh, another example, the memoirs of Adam Andonian, or not so much memoirs as his own reflections on his um, experience uh, through the genocide. Uh, Lauren Cherinian has also published survivor memoirs uh, of the Armenian Genocide. That came out in 1999. And we have collections of oral histories that are coming out, um, being published. There's a Center for Oral History at UCLA that's being very active in trying to collect these oral histories and publish them, um, uh, recording them. And we also have the archive at Columbia University um, of oral histories of survivors telling their stories. So there's a wealth of information out there now um, that is also waiting to be studied. Right? There not, more and more information is coming out um, and uh, it just requires more scholars to look at it as well. Let's look at it at the other side, though, the denialist position. These are pretty much the claims uh, uh, from the denialist side. Um, systematic large-scale atrocities did not occur. This one has been obviously very hard to substantiate. Ah, maybe, you know, 1,500 Armenians were killed. Uh, or, for example, I've been to the museum uh, on, uh, in Van. They have a whole wing of the museum or a whole room of the museum dedicated to the Armenian Genocide. That is how the Armenians killed all the Turks in the area. And they have a whole room filled with skulls saying these are Turkish skulls that the Armenians killed. Uh, one then wonders what, why there are no Armenians in Van, but the, that's a, a, a different question that they don't answer. The other, I would say, more sophisticated approach is that it did not constitute genocide. Yes, there were a, a large amount of people Kill. And they started off with 500,000, then they grudgingly accepted 800,000, then a million. And recently I've seen Turkish denialists say 1.5 million, but it does not constitute genocide. Right? First of all, many people died in World War I. Right? In fact, more Turks died in World War I than Armenians. Just like more Germans died than Jews in World War I. More Russians died too. That doesn't, has, what does one have to do with the other? It was, I mean, World War I was a terrible war. 
but they're not connected. Uh, another uh, line uses that the Armenians deserved it. It what I mean, you'll often see this all come together. This a there weren't that many killed. B the way they were killed was not genocidal, right? And C in any case they were going to be traitorous and join the Russians, so they deserved to be killed. Um, uh, and, and this will follow uh, uh, one after another. Another um, um, uh, claim is discontinuity that I mentioned before. That was the Ottoman Empire. It has nothing to do with us today. We have nothing to talk about. Right? None, none of the people, obviously, yes, none of the people are alive. But the Republic of Turkey has nothing to do um, uh, uh, with the Ottoman Empire. And therefore, um, uh, we, have, we have no reason to actually admit to anything because there's nothing to do with us. Um, that's why the, the, there is uh, a need to emphasize the continuity that both the political and the economic con um, uh, constitution of the Republic of Turkey is based upon, right, or is based partially upon, um, uh, 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 the genocide. The way they try and support these claims is first by blaming others. A, we had no reason to do this, but because of European pressures, um, we were put in a position where we had no sort of recourse but to kill um, the Armenians, um, or blaming the Armenians themselves. Um, an early tactic was just to forget about it. They just didn't talk about it at all. It just, and you'll still see this to this day. I was flying on Turkish Airlines once, and they had a, um, a whole section on the town of Klat, the beautiful city on Lake Van, and they gave a whole history of it, from the Sumerians all the way down to the present. The word Armenian wasn't mentioned once, even though Armenians had lived there for 3,000 years. Um, they just never existed. Um, you can also prohibit other people from mentioning it, right? through political, economic, or religious blackmail. Uh, and this happens all the time. If your country uh, accepts it, well, you know, if the United States accepts it, who knows where Turkey is going to go. Maybe we'll become Islamic fundamentalist. You can't count on us for NATO. We're going to cut off economic ties with you. We won't let you use our air bases. Um, and in fact, when France recognized the genocide, Turkey did cut off relations for six months. And right now, they're in the process of negotiation because uh, France uh, just recently, it hasn't been enacted, passed a bill saying um, uh, that it would be illegal to deny the genocide. That if you wrote that uh, the genocide didn't happen, you could be arrested and fined. Um, this is now awaiting uh, the decision of whether that's a constitutional law or not. But uh, nonetheless, Turkey again got uh, very angry at that. Um, they also sponsor politicians and academics. They found chairs at universities. Um, they also tell academics that if you want a visa, if you're a Turkologist and you want a visa, it's probably useful if you toe the right line. Um, and obviously they have lobbying efforts. That's uh, not surprising. Right? Uh, one of the more, I would say, to me, disgusting tactics is acknowledging the Holocaust, uh, which is something that they do. And uh, I'm glad they do it. They should do it. There's no problem with that. Except they say, how can we be denying a genocide since we acknowledge the Holocaust? as though that were a logical argument. Um, but they, they say, since we, we understand what a genocide is, we obviously didn't commit one in the past. Um, I've also heard them, uh, you know, between Turkey and Israel, they've debated as to whether what Israel is doing to Palestinians should be considered genocide, to which the Israelis responded, well, you should know. Um, and uh, that was a tense sort of interaction. Um, things are in flux in that relationship uh, at the moment. Recently, in fall 2011, uh, in the journal Middle East Critique, um, you can find a series of articles uh, that were put together that were meant there to reassess um, the entire problematic issue of uh, the, uh, the deportation of the Armenians from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and it's structured as though there are two competing narratives. There's the Armenian nationalist narrative that it was a genocide, and then there's the Turkish revisionist narrative in which it says that it wasn't a genocide. And the, uh, uh, the editor of, the, uh, of that issue um, comes in and says, well, it's a, we've had a fruitful discussion in which obviously you know, the claims to it being a genocide have been seriously undermined, right? but we need a, a new discourse on how to approach the question of this uh, relocation of this population. And as I said, one, it was in one of those articles that someone argued uh, that we can't use the term genocide because it's anachronistic, it wasn't around in World War I, and it's too emotional a term. Um, to be used against uh, 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 the perpetrators. Um, you'll find a, a sort of a combination of all of these uh, um, uh, sort of a denialist tactics um, in those articles. It's actually rather frustrating to read. 
On the other hand, it has been recognized as genocide by all of these organizations. Okay? And over 20 countries and 44 US states. Unfortunately, the United States of America as a country does not officially recognize this as a genocide. It's still a sort of great tragedy that has befallen the Armenian people at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, or some such circumlocution as that. Um, uh, it's a shame um, considering our tremendous efforts after the genocide to help the Armenians, uh, um, it, it actually is it's shameful and, and rather uh, a depressing low point, uh, I would say, in our, in our ability to handle these sorts of questions. But thankfully, um, all of these institutions, and really several, I mean, it's the International Encyclopedia of Genocide um, uh, has the Armenian Genocide in it. There have been many people from around the world that have spoken out um, for its recognition, and um, they really are um, instrumental for spreading the word, and so we're very fortunate that they're doing that. Now, the legacy of denialism has been the continued problems in Eastern Anatolia. Right? On the one hand, we have the legacy of the genocide, and on the other hand, there's also a legacy to the denialism. People may uh, know that the, 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 that the Republic of Turkey still has a problem with the, now the Kurdish inhabitants of um, Eastern Anatolia, and they are locked in a struggle with them. This is one of the legacies of their not being able to come to terms with what happened there in their history is perpetrated, is uh, perpetuated um, these sort of conflicts. Sorry. We have the development of Armenian terrorist organizations in the 70s and 80s. It should be a Salah and, and, uh, and uh, JCAG. Um, they uh, committed some, I would say, horrendous attacks in the 70s and 80s, um, but this was a direct uh, response, um, not one that I agree with, but nonetheless it was one out of frustration uh, for the continued denial uh, of the genocide and its lack of recognition by anybody. And as much as I may deplore their methodologies in which they killed hundreds of innocent people as well, um, it did bring the Armenian genocide to the world's attention again, and people started talking about it. So it's unfortunate that it took that sort of um, um, uh, activity in order to bring it back to people's minds, but they did succeed in bringing up the, uh, the issue again, though they didn't succeed in any of their other aims. Um, and there's a lack of reconciliation between Armenians and Turkey to this day. The lack of recognition obviously means that there is a constant um, uh, tension uh, between peoples who have a, sh a shared history right, that could be much more fruitful um, uh, a much more fruitful future if they were able um, to overcome this, if, if recognition uh, were properly um, um, acknowledged uh, by the Republic of Turkey. And it makes the resolution of the current conflict between Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh extremely more difficult to resolve. Um, for Armenians, what's going on in Nagorno-Karabakh has the echo of what happened during the genocide and it's through that paradigm that they see this conflict. Um, and so the, the lack of recognition, the lack of acknowledgement has also made, uh, made this, the resolution of this conflict a lot more difficult to achieve. So you can see there, there are no positive results um, of, of, uh, of the denialist position. Lessons. There are three important lessons that can be drawn from the Armenian Genocide. These are three most important. They shouldn't be that difficult to remember. Education, education, education. Okay, this is the thing that people, uh, th and it's why I'm grateful for this lecture series in particular. Right? The only way right, that the Ar Armenian Genocide can actually be useful right, as a positive instrument is through education. Educating people about what happened in order that they may become dedicated to preventing right, the occurrence of such an atrocity again. And it's not obviously the Armenian Genocide alone. It happens within the greater context of, unfortunately, what seems to be common uh, not just to any particular group of people, but to humanity in general. And that's what makes genocide, in some senses, so scary. It's that all of us are capable of doing it. Right? The question is whether all of us can be capable of preventing it. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm, I'm very <laughs> willing to take questions.
Yeah, the, the, it was, it was, yeah, the, the, the railroad, the Berlin to Baghdad railroad was hub, heavily subsidized by Germany. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and here I'm going to be speaking from my own opinion rather than uh, you know, through any sort of in-depth knowledge of American foreign policy or any special information that I have on American foreign policy. But yes, I mean, Turkey obviously um, is an economically and political uh, successful country in the Middle East, and it is a democracy. I mean, people vote, in, and it is held forth as a paradigm for um, Islamic countries in the region that they could aspire to be like Turkey, pro-Western, they can retain their Islamic faith, but they can have democratic values, they can have capitalist values, they can succeed economically. That makes it very attractive uh, from an American policy standpoint for where are you going to um, uh, uh, hang your hopes for stability in the Middle East. The other reason is, yes, it's a part of NATO, it's a strategic ally. We have a radar, ba radar base on Mount Ararat um, it was, that was important uh, against the Soviet Union. We have military bases there. They, were gr they did not allow us to use them during the Iraq War, despite the fact that they were our ally. But nonetheless, um, uh, they still serve an important strategic um, role within our concept of foreign policy. Now, the question I have on that, I mean, and I don't deny them that. I mean, they, they, they um, maneuvered, I would say, the political waters of the, post, uh, or the Cold War and the post-Cold War era, I think, very well. Uh, the question is whether they would be able to, whether they would be willing to shoot themselves in the foot over something that is, uh, for us, I think, a, a, a moral imperative. Because we may need Turkey, but I think Turkey needs Europe and the United States much more than we need them. Um, and this has got to be a symbiotic relationship. I have no problem having a strategic alliance uh, with the Republic of Turkey. What I have a problem with is the Republic of Turkey telling us what we believe our moral standards should be. I'm also not saying that the United States should force Turkey to accept it. I mean, I don't think that's our right to do it. They should come to it of their own accord. But we shouldn't be prevented from accepting it ourselves when we know it to be true. And, and, and deny our own history in that way. Um, I find that incredibly problematic, and I don't consider that the, uh, the actions of an ally. And if you're a friend and a strategic partner, then you, don't, you shouldn't be trying to intimidate them in that way. Yeah. And there was a question over here? Yeah. I don't actually know that. I know California does. Oh, sorry. He was asking which states don't actually um, um, uh, recognize uh, the genocide. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, and I'm not, I, I would presume there are states with very few Armenians in them. But um, in, in, in the sense of, I, I don't think it's um, on purpose. Right? I just don't think the issue has been raised. I mean, I know California does. Right? And, and that's, but unfortunately, I do, not, I do not have a list of the six states that um, uh, haven't yet done that. I'm curious if you know if uh, genocide raised questions about the United States' own indigenous policies during that time. During that time? Yeah. I don't think a connection was made. I mean, A, um, they, in fact, it's interesting if you look at, um, uh, I should preface, the, the amount of good that uh, was done is also then followed up by a period in, 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 in which we enacted quotas, severe quotas on all non-Northern European immigrants in order to keep out um, people who were not considered to be as good as Northern white folk in that sense. Um, and it's interesting, I don't know if you've done, I've, I've asked friends of mine, um, if, if you're an immigrant to this country or your ancestors were immigrants, you notice that they, m nearly all of them came between, I mean there were several earlier immigrations, but 1880, in, 19, uh, in the 1920s, and then there's a huge gap until after World War II, and that's because we basically closed off our borders. After having taken in all of these people um, and um, done all of this uh, uh, work, uh, we then proceeded to close our borders and try to um, uh, prevent other people that uh, we thought uh, were not worthy of entering in the United States. Um, but I, and I found it interesting, if you, I don't know of any Armenians, for example, whose families came from the 30s to the, uh, to the 40s. They came either right uh, before the genocide, right immediately afterwards, 
or as my own family in 1960, in the, 50s, in the late 50s and 60s. So the bright side is, is the humanitarian effort that was uh, raised. The dark side is it doesn't seem to have, that I know of, and I'm not a student of American history per se on this period, um, raised the consciousness of Americans, or at least of the American government, towards um, uh, 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 people of, of, of ethnic backgrounds, as far as I know. So, uh, you, uh, you may be more informed if you had a comment based on that. No, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, just um, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure that answers your question at all, but that's, I, I, I'm just not particularly knowledgeable in that, in that question. Um, this seems to be a, a sentiment, oh sorry, the question was um, why would the Armenians be ashamed of what happened during the genocide? Um, and this is not an easy one to answer, not being a, a survivor myself or even from a background of survivors. This seems to be a common um, sentiment felt uh, by many uh, uh, victims. Uh, the fact that they're ashamed that they allowed this to happen, uh, that they didn't, um, that they weren't able to defend themselves, and also they're ashamed that they survived. A lot of people felt guilty that they survived and everyone else they knew died. Um, and I said, I, it's, I can't fully em empathize with it having not gone through something like that. I, I only know what other people um, ha have told me and through um, also uh, analogous situations, but it's it, it really is heart rendering when you think about what these people went through. I mean, not only did they lose, you know, many of them lost, I mean, particularly a lot of the people who survived were young women, but they lost every man in their, in their household. They lost their father, they lost their brothers, they lost their uncles, right? They lost their children if they had them, if they were very young, and, and, they, and they often lost their mother. The people who survived were normally between 9 and 15. The majority of survivors, and this is true of um, many, um, uh, many of these uh, uh, traumatic uh, uh, events, are children who are strong enough um, to, uh, uh, to make such a journey. So if, if they were younger, they were usually too weak, but not old enough to have been either singled out by the authorities for execution right, or not be burdened. Right? If you were 18 and you are a woman, you were likely pregnant or you had a child, you were going to die because you were feet, breastfeeding, you went through, you were weakened by, uh, uh, by given birth, and, and, and they normally died. So it was normally these adolescent, for the most, for the most part, between 9 and 15, um, uh, who survived. They never got to know, I mean, their parents as adults. They never really, they know they have these families. Um, some people already, they were split. Let's say the, the wife or the, I mean, the husband or the eldest son had been sent abroad, but the rest of the family had left behind. Um, we have uh, numerous instances of where people had to remarry. Um, they had already had one entire family, and that was entirely eliminated. And now they got remarried and had a second family. And all these complex emotions, you know, they don't have psychiatrists. They didn't have therapists, right? They didn't have a social system in America that would, you know, or any country that would take care of them. Basically, you got here and what you had to do, make a living. So they went to work, right? And they, and they kept quiet about everything, right? And tried to do the best they could. Um, but it was this, the entire social fabric uh, uh, of their lives had been torn to pieces, and they didn't know why either. Many of them felt like it was their fault, right? It was, and again, these are these are are are, are feelings shared uh, by survivors, um, and the, obviously all the reactions, emotional, psychological reactions to this sort of traumatic event, I mean, are, are incredibly complex. Uh, but unfortunately, there, w there weren't social services available to help them out at that time. Christine, did you have a comment on that? It's, it's not so much the sense of being shamed. Uh, uh, yeah. Christine, being a third generation of survivor, the sense of inferiority. We were an inferior people, we were taught to be inferior people, and then all of a sudden, everybody else is dead. Therefore, we must be inferior. That's my sense. That's what I've been brought up. Yes. Yeah, I grew up in Vesta Valley around Vesta. Uh -huh. I remember a large Armenian population there. Yeah. Um, do you know about when the majority of the first generation arrived there and why? 
Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I didn't know much about the, this is a question about the Fresno Armenian population. And, and um, it's an, actually, it's an incredibly interesting community. And I must admit, before I moved there, I didn't know much about, about them. Um, but the, the, the Fresno community, the heart of the, the early um, um, members of the Fresno community, and it's one of the earliest settlements in the United States of Armenians, um, had been brought from the town of Marzavan in eastern Turkey, where there had been one of those colleges. Um, and, and it was Protestant missionaries. Many of them had um, converted to uh, uh, Episcopalianism and were brought, uh, sorry, Presbyterianism, and were brought um, to Fresno. Uh, promised a wonderful land and uh, a beautiful life. And they were actually quite annoyed when they got there because they had come from what was, for them, a town. And then Fresno was not yet developed into this agricultural like, sort of gold mine. And they got there, it, was, it needed to be irrigated, there was nothing there, they almost strangled the minister. And, 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 and he said to them, don't worry, don't worry, it'll work out. Um, but the, the, the older community, and, that, and that's unique, I'm, on the East Coast it's a very different phenomenon. But in, in, in Fresno, you, the, one of the oldest levels of that community is, is Protestant rather than Apostolic. Now, our, other Armenians started to come afterwards, and this is again normal for most immigrant migrations. The, the major areas, uh, wound up being New York and Worcester, Massachusetts, um, uh, Detroit, Racine, Wisconsin, and then Fresno, and then later Los Angeles. And mainly this had to do with where people were originally settled and uh, the kind of uh, work that could be found there. And the agricultural um, life that developed in Fresno was also amenable to a lot of the uh, people who had been farmers um, in, 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 in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, when they got to the East Coast, for example, in Worcester, the major source of work was a shoe factory. And they didn't like working indoors, so they, they were told that there were Armenians out west and they, and they continued to go. And this built up the community, but it's been constantly re, um, reinvigorated. So you had that generation, then you had people who came after, and that was before the Hamidian massacres, they were brought out there. Then you had people who came after the Hamidian, Hamidian massacres, and people after the genocide. Then people from the Middle East who came after the uh, nationalist uh, revolutions uh, in the Arab world and the, and the revolution in Iran. And now you have people from the Republic of Armenia there as well. So it's a very diverse community and it's, a, it's one with many layers to it. And uh, for me, it's just been absolutely fascinating. It's a great experience um, uh, to having gotten to know them. Thank, Thank you for your question. I wish we could go on. I know from experience that many of the students have jobs, and that I'm sure the ones who went out quite rudely out that door when they slammed. Um, I hope you'll never do that anymore. But anyway, I'd like to thank Professor. Okay.